And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday, and thanks for joining us here on our personal Friday climate protest known as Climate Change Roundtable, which is number 79 in the series. With us today are our usable, use, usable or usual, I don't know, whatever they are. Are you usable? Our usual suspects, <laughs> Dr. Sterling Burnett and Linnea Lucan. Welcome, guys. Hello, Anthony. Thank you Good very to be much. back. Good to be back. Yeah, what's, what's shaking in the climate world these days? Mm. <laughs> a, a lot of repression. A lot of repression. Yeah. A lot of lies. Of repression. Oh, but wait, that's not new. <laughs> same nothing old, same new old. Under the sun. Yep. Yeah, nothing new under the sun, right? Yeah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about oppression and bullying and all the good things associated with science these days, right? Yeah. But first, we want to get to the crazy climate news of the week. And the first one is, gee, gosh, how how should I deal with caring more about my about climate change and my partner? Um and the subtitle is, How do alarmists cope when their partner inconsiderately brings home a loaf of bread wrapped in plastic despite a freezer full of homemade bread? So I wonder, what do you wrap the, fr the freezer of homemade bread in? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. But butcher's paper, right? Yeah. Ah. It'll, last, it'll last forever. It, it, of course, it'll be... It won't be bread any longer. It'll be crackers, uh, dried you know, out holes of bread. I don't mean to be judgmental, but it kind of sounds like someone needs to get better at making bread if their husband is buying <laughs> bread instead of eating the fresh homemade bread that they made. Uh, a good point. Then again, if your partner is going to complain for climate reasons about your use of plastic or or things, you know, I, I don't say walk away from a r relationship lightly, but I don't know how I, how long I'd be able to put up with uh, some climate scold in my household. Fortunately, my wife's intelligent. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> well, your household <laughs> might be a special, <laughs> special case where you don't have to worry about that. I don't think you'd put up with it to begin with uh, Yeah. before uh, it got that far. Anyway, I wonder what the carbon footprint of making your own bread is in your own oven. Preferably not a gas oven, because those are evil, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Compared to store-bought, I mean, who knows? I mean, it, it, the, the minutiae that they're going to these days to complain about is just mind-boggling. Mm. Um, you know yeah, what? Plastic Actually, is a I godsend. Would... What would we do without it? Right. And that's what Christine Laurel says right there on the screen. And, you know, George Carlin mentioned that he was talking about plastic back in the 60s when I, during one of his shticks. He said, you know, maybe everybody says plastic is bad. You know, well, plastic is made up of stuff out of the earth. Maybe the earth just wanted plastic for itself. <laughs> or, or maybe it's a, it's the Aristotelian final final end of what, fossil, you know, oil uh was so oil is, is at raw state and plastic and gasoline are its uh yeah. how did how did it stop put it, its final end basically believed that there was a, a a hierarchy that you built towards that things naturally gravitated towards yeah well then there's of course the famous scene in the graduate one yep. word plastics. plastics anyway all right next one this is from Linnea. This is a great story because, uh, you know, immediately when the rain happened and turned Burning Man into Mudhole Man, 
you know, the people that were out there uh, started screaming about it's climate change, it's climate change, like it's never rained in the desert ever before. Gosh. Anyway. And so Linnea wrote about all of the insanity associated with these claims that climate change just swooped right down on Burning Man and turned it into a mud hole. It's amazing how specific climate change is, right, Linnea? It really is. And the amazing thing, too, and I think that this might be, um, again, not to be overly judgmental, but a factor of the events that go on at Burning Man, but many of the people in, interviewed by New York Times and some of the other um, articles that were covering this said that, uh, you know, this has never happened before. We've never seen it turn into a mud apocalypse here. Um, it's in unprecedented. <laughs> it happens all the time. Maybe not to quite this extent where people are getting stuck there and stuff, but actually, um, I think it was maybe 2006 or something where people were stuck there. But um, considering what goes on at this event, I would not be surprised if their memories are not super good. <laughs> um, well, regarding, you know, festivals. Yeah, I think I think it shows that the present generation really are snowflakes. When Woodstock happened, uh, <laughs> the, 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 a torrential downpour, and rather than complaining and saying, oh, my God, we're dying, oh, this is awful, they actually did mudslides, and they played in the mud, and they danced in the rain, and uh, no one thought it was a world-ending event. Uh, but nowadays, you'd think a lot of these elites that go to these things, they might think the mud was – they go take mud baths. Well, you know, it's free. And you know what? Go there and it's free. The mud that they have there too, because it's a bentonite and gypsum type, like dusty ground that they have there. It is precisely the type of mud that they use in mud baths. Of course it is. So I don't know what they're complaining about. Bentonite, you can go to the store and you can buy bentonite mud masks right now. It's, they were getting uh, it for free out there. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it's not as good if you don't pay ten thousand dollars for it for these guys, right? Right. It, it's it's not cheap when you just simply get it out there in the desert, right? You get it, yeah. Yeah, it's not the kind of desert um, that is like sandy desert. It's a high plains like clay, mostly clay. That's why they're famous for having dust storms. That's why some of the like most common aesthetics and the photography that comes out of Burning Man that's so famous is of these whiteouts where everyone is wearing like scarves and goggles and neon decorations on themselves and stuff and partying in these dust storms that can actually be pretty dangerous, but they don't seem, they don't seem to be too worried about that, but they are worried about um, a little bit of rain from a hurricane, which as Anthony has covered many times was not in fact unprecedented for the area. No. Maybe, you know, maybe they, um, Maybe their complaint was, you know, you've, I've seen these pictures where they do the body painting stuff. And maybe their complaint was either A, the body paint was washing off after they'd gone to such a great extent. Maybe they were even fearful of their nudity showing. Or uh, I think I think they just weren't getting to show off. The mud, mud was replacing the body paint. And so people weren't awed. Oh, look at what... Uh, I won't say any personal names, but I suspect there were a lot of celebrities there who go there every year and uh, didn't get to show off their latest outfit because of the mud and the rain. Yeah. All right. So enough about muddy burning man. Now we're going off to the UN. And yes, the Foggy UN man. has come up with another wonderful pronouncement from the same guy that brought you global boiling. We've got this one. Climate breakdown has begun. Oh, no. Not only is it boiling, the oceans are boiling, but climate breakdown, which is a, a catch-all phrase. And who knows what that means? I think we got a picture of this guy, uh, the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres. There he is. He's, he's preparing for climate breakdown. He's getting ready to mask himself. <laughs> Uh, I thought I thought that. I thought Gutierrez was being re was out and he was replaced. I guess that was the the UN the IPCC guy is 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 new. 
Yeah. But uh, what what of what does the breakdown supposedly consist? Well, according to what I've read, from, uh, let me take that back. According to what I can make sense of, um, climate breakdown has begun uh, because the World Meteorological Organization reported that the world went through its hotter northern hemisphere summer on record. Now, the, the world went through the hottest northern hemisphere, not the southern hemisphere, the world. You know, it's just, eh. And, and, and in what sense does that indicate breakdown? I mean, if I go to the doctor because I've got a temperature, he doesn't say your body's breaking down. It's, it's a very specific thing. I don't um, know. But there isn't there doesn't exist a climate triple A, so we don't know what breakdown is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder when we really do and they're saying right now that this summer pushed us over one point five. Um and the you know, correct points that people like Steve Malloy have made is that, you know, it can't be one summer of above 1.5. It needs to be sustained in order to claim that we've actually reached that point. That's the first point. But second, even if it does, you know, does that mean, because you guys have been saying for years that it's too late now and that we now get to focus on mitigation uh, and that you'll leave us alone and stop trying to tax us to death and make us eat bugs? Does, is that what that means? That I just it's too keep, late now? I just keep waiting for them to... To, to be wrong on one of these predictions about sort of the deadline, oh, by, if it does this by this date, it's we passed the tipping point. It's too late for one of them to say, you know what, we've passed the tipping point. Go out, get you a bottle of wine, sit on the grass, look at the sun go down because the world's coming to That's an a end. That's a tipping point, Sterling. A tipping point. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just, I, it's like, hold it. When is one of these things going to be the real thing? And then you say, okay, we've reached it. It's too late. Let's just enjoy the life we have left. Because that's the implication. If there's a deadline for the end of the world, then when you've reached that deadline, it's like, okay, I'm just not going to torture myself any longer. I'm not going to wear the hair shirt anymore. I'm going to enjoy what life I have left. And they never reach that point. It's all, they're, they're a death cult. And when the death date passes and the world doesn't end, they just set a new date. You know, maybe what we need for climate is a best experience by date applied every year. <laughs> exactly. You no, know, Sterling. Best we by can, date. We compare them to the, you know, kind of famous... 20th century um, doomsday cults and stuff. Uh, the people who have been predicting over and over again that, and are relatively famous on television for it, for predicting over and over again that we're going to get the rapture any day or whatever it happens to be. But the most famous of those, and I can't recall his name right now, but who had a radio show and all sorts of stuff, who was very big in, I think, the 70s and 80s, he admitted that he was wrong after being proven wrong like two times in a row. He eventually threw in the towel and said, okay, maybe I'm not a prophet. <laughs> but these guys over and over and over again cannot get it right. Yeah. You know, very few people that have prophesied, no, I'll take that back. I don't know of anyone that has prophesied the end of the world that turned out to be right. Hmm. Do we have any examples? Any working examples? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, goodness. Those, My those Mayans were close, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> All right. And finally this week, which kind of goes to the topic we're going to talk about, is Journal Gate. Journal Gate. Yes, we have this wonderful cartoon from our resident cartoonist at WWT, uh, Josh. This has to do with Patrick T. Brown. Patrick T. Brown this week announced that I didn't put everything in this paper because I was afraid it wouldn't get published. And if I had put everything in, it would have gotten rejected. So basically, you know, science on the stand this week, fibbing. But, you know, I will hand it to Patrick T. Brown because he did something that no one else does or has done. And that is he came clean on Twitter and he says, you know, I'm uncomfortable with this, but I did this to get the paper published. And here's what I didn't put in. And so he came clean, at least, and 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 that is is admirable. But on the other hand, you know, science is supposed to be about truth, and so it's kind of a mixed bag, you know. Well, uh, it, 
you know, his argument is this. He, he's not on the stand, right? It, and when you're on the stand, they don't just say, tell the truth. They say, tell the truth, the whole truth, and right. nothing but the truth. Brown stands by what he wrote. Brown stands by the paper. He says, look, climate change has had an effect on California wildfires. It's a very narrow claim. Uh, and he says it's by a certain amount. So that's the truth. But we didn't tell the whole truth, which is there's a lot of other factors that our data shows are as important as climate change or more important than climate change. But we didn't write about those because we wanted to get in the journal. And that's basically his argument. And, and yeah. so uh, he's not on the legal stand. I guess as a scientist, you're not obligated to tell things um, that are outside of what you want to discuss. Yeah. Uh, and he had a reason for discussing what he wanted to discuss. He wanted to get published. Yeah. He I'm also gonna... mentioned uh, in detail how competitive science has become mm -hmm. compared to what it was 30 or 40 years ago, particularly in the climate field, because there's so much money being thrown at climate science. You know, I mean, despite the fact that everyone on the other side of the um, aisle thinks that all the money is being thrown at us climate skeptics, I'm still waiting for my big oil check. But the bottom line is, is there's so much money being thrown at climate science that it's and so many more doctorates have been produced and so many more papers are being produced. <coughs> it, it's becoming really competitive just to get a paper published at all simply due to volume. And that was one of the things that he talked about and, and as to, you know, why it had to stand out. Uh, but the bottom line is, is he talked about uh, wildfires in California and he used modeling and AI to sort out data, oh, which isn't a really particularly good approach, especially since it completely ignores the fact that forest management in California has mm -hmm. been a huge and well-recognized problem. He didn't talk about that at all. He alluded to it briefly in, in the... Uh, abstract, but that's all. So, you know, on one hand, he did something very good. He exposed the dark underbelly of peer review and publishing. On the other hand, he didn't tell the whole truth. But like I say, it's kind of a mixed bag. Now, Anthony, would you say, you know, as someone who has published and, you know, based, you know, that AI comment, is it that novelty is sometimes part of the key of getting published in some of this stuff. You know, if you're using a novel way to parse data in some way, even if it's not particularly useful in the real world in any way, um, is that something that will help you to get published over someone who uses a, you know, a classic technique that is, you know, well-founded, that works? Is that, I think is that so. probably part of it? And, and, you know, this actually happened with Michael Mann on the hockey stick. He came up with this, this, I don't know, it's like he invented it in his garage on his, on his workbench, this statistical analysis technique, something centered PCA, which Steve McIntyre showed what turned out to be absolute garbage. But the peer review people ate it up. They made it the front cover of Nature. It went into the IPCC report. Ooh, it's new. It's novel. It's, it must be better. Turned out to be a giant load of crap. You could throw uh, red noise at the thing and it would produce hockey sticks. You know, it was just like a hockey stick generator. And we've joked about this over the years that man's original hockey stick research was absolute garbage, but it was novel and it was new and it was saying what they wanted to hear. And so, boom, it gets front and center. Well, and it produces a graphic that is probably one of the most widely circulated. Um, you know, I've been I've been in debates before with friends, just, you know, people that I know um, about climate issues. And the first thing they send me is a, a hockey stick chart. And they say, right. how can you deny this? And I'm like, <sighs> now I have to. And then but it's kind of a non-starter. It's a very frustrating position to be put into when you're trying to have a good faith discussion with someone because they don't know, for the most part, how to determine whether something is decent data to use in that context or not, or, well, you know, a good strategy. So what you end up having to do is backpedal and explain why the source that they sent you is wrong. And it ends up being this whole, like, worthless conversation. It, it's, it's very frustrating. Uh, it but is. it was effective. And, you know, it's in high school textbooks. It's in middle school textbooks in science classes. So 
that whatever, however good or bad it was, and it was very bad, um, it was effective in delivering a narrative. And yes. it's very hard to disconnect the tendrils of a narrative yeah. like that in order to toss it back. Oh, yeah. well, look at how it's long hard to... Steve McIntyre had to work to connect all the dots in that thing to figure out that it was indeed crap. Yeah, it's it how to how to disabuse. It's difficult to disabuse people of a narrative once they've uh, <clears throat> sort of incorporated it into their worldview. I um, you know, I'm wondering how it, how what his co-authors' responses were to this uh, disclosure. He he hasn't said. But I haven't seen any of them out there saying anything either. I mean, it's it's something that they had to know, by the way. I mean, you know, it's not like he hid half the data from them. No, they all knew going in that they weren't saying certain things. And he said, now I'm I'm saying it. Now, did they all agree in advance that he could go ahead and do that? Are they now upset? What's, you know, what's going on there? Uh, concerning, well, it's not just the hockey stick. So much of this stuff is just... It's just poor crap. Um, didn't McIntyre's analysis show that it didn't matter what numbers you plugged in, you got the same result? Pretty much, yeah. That, you could that, throw in a variety of different things, <laughs> like red noise, for example, and it would put yeah. hockey sticks out. Um, yeah. It was just the, the statistical methodology was the main creator of the hockey stick, not the data itself. Well, and the well, and what's interesting about this paper um and I, you know, I know we'll get to some more, but what's interesting about this paper is he he specifically said in the paper, this was in the abstract, climate models were inadequate. We couldn't do what we wanted to do with climate models because they don't right. do regions. And so we went to AI. So AI is filling in stuff that these complex climate models can't do. And we're supposed to trust that as if AI knows more about physics than physicists do and modelers do when it's just a once again it's just another tool and it's only as good as the input so it's um yeah ai is just another regurgitating robot as far as i'm concerned you know it gives <laughs> you an output that you train it to do well and here's my question is there a place for studies is it in you got in your opinions, is there a place for studies that are laser focused in on a particular element of an issue like the Climate Change and Wildfires Association? So if there was and I think it's such a minor piece of it that it's it would be really hard to be able to put a number to it as as the paper apparently claims that it has. But if there is an influence of, you know, average global warming on regional wildfire increase if there is an increase at all even um, well as if as if average global warming means yeah. anything right look right when you go to a doctor he has a norm to work from 98.6 degrees is what the healthcare community at some point determined is the 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 average temperature of a healthy person um, and if you deviate too far, too low, or too high above that, you're considered ill. The Earth ain't a living entity, folks. Uh, Gaia don't exist. And we don't know. There's no thermometer we can stick in its mouth and say, or you know, rub across its head and say, ooh, that's above the average. Well, hold it. We don't know. Historically. All we've got is proxy data, which is a gross representation based on your assumptions about certain things. But there's no God's eye point of view that says this is the right temperature that the earth should be. And yeah, aim I'll point to, out, no aim one has come up with the mean. what the right temperature is. That's it. Hey. Aim towards the mean. Uh, well, what is the mean? What what are we supposed to? And and so they made it up. The whole the whole global average temperature is just a collection of numbers from around the globe, added up and then divided by the number of numbers. That's the average temperature. What does that say about California? It says nothing about California oh. um, or, or anything or any place else for that matter. It's a made up number. And 
whether that made up number actually means anything about the world's climate, <laughs> that can't be determined. No, no. But, you know, I could keep going back to what I call uh, the three bears model. What we need is the temperature is not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up the um, Gaia thing because it is in the 1980s, there was um, this theory. I think it was called like the Gaia hypothesis of the earth or something like that. And, and there was a model that was produced to try to model some of the radiative effects of the sun on a planet um, and, al and its relation to albedo and stuff. And so this model called Daisy World was developed. And sometimes it, and it's very simplistic. It's basically a planet is covered with X percent black daisies, X percent white daisies, and your average um, albedo will be different based on what those percentages are. And the planet will, in one way or another, if it tips too far in either direction, cause some kind of a positive feedback that will end up causing the planet to become like an icebox or um, just roast to death, basically. Um, and, I, and this is a really simplistic version of that basic model. But sometimes it feels like this is the unironically and and without very much nuance the perspective that some of these climate modelers are taking they're saying you know here's because you can't really be ultra accurate on all of the different functions and we've talked about this on previous episodes before where you know the the average effect whether it's an on average cooling effect or an on average warming effect of clouds is still unknown. <laughs> um, you know, people yeah. debate it. They have strong opinions in either direction, but there isn't a really good consensus on it. If we you don't even have good data on clouds, that's the no, problem. No, it's it's impossible. They, at, they can't model you know, with current technology. Yeah. So, so when when someone is modeling something like, does global average temperature increase increase the occurrence of wildfire in a particular part of the country. And I'm not trying to make any super specific claims on the paper itself. I have not read deep into it. So maybe there's better arguments than what I've seen presented uh, online recently. Um, it just, it seems almost, almost simplistic to the point of being useless. And I, I don't mean to be offensive with that. It just, I wonder, you know, what's nature, what's their point in producing a paper in their limited space in the first place that that doesn't really have anything like, okay, you gave us this model that shows X percent of global warming is causing X percent of wildfires in California, allegedly. And <laughs> that's the right word I to mean, use. Thank you for using that, by the way. Yeah. So, so I guess the point of my rambling here is, what is the point? Well, let me. What, what is the point of the journal? The I'm going to. I'm going. I'm going to defend him on that. I'm going yeah. to defend him on that. So two things. First off, it's not just. Um, it, it's not just alarmists that believe in some self-regulating system. Richard Lindzen believes in a, uh, that the Earth is largely self-regulating, not because it's a conscious entity called Gaia, but uh, he thinks that uh, at the you know as I understand it, there's a, an iris effect uh, around the the equator. But um, nature, this is, this is why I think, this is where I think Brown can be defended in, to this extent. You say, and? Scientists' job isn't to, to answer and. They're supposed to, dis, to, to discover facts and present facts and let other people worry about the and. That's the problem with climate science, is they're getting into the and too much. They're saying this is the policy that should flow from this. They're stepping outside of the realm of science. They did that as soon as they started talking about consensus. And they went into the realm of politics. They want to be mini dictators. Follow, I mean, they tell you, follow the science. So that's what the end is. And I don't want them saying the end. I want them to stick in the journals to, this is what we've discovered. 
you guys in the wider world or in the political world, you got to decide what to do with this. That's not our job. Our job is to give you facts and data. So I don't want them saying and. I, I don't want any of them saying and. I want them to stay in their lane. Yeah. So in addition to, we have this paper that was published by Nature that, you know, allegedly might have some facts in it, uh, and then, but certainly didn't have all the facts in it by the lead author's admission. Then we've got another paper in the past couple of weeks that had been retracted yep. uh, because of bullying. And this is from the ClimateGate crowd. It was called Alamante AL. Um, and um, no, that's not it. Um, Okay, it says Alamante et al. Retraction bullying. Uh, Wolf on the lamb. Yeah. So um, basically, what we had is this paper that looked at. There it is. Thank you. Let's scroll down on that, please. Um, basically, this particular paper looked at the climate crisis, the alleged climate crisis, right? It went and looked at hard data, not models, not AI. Not some unique statistical novel approach. It just went through plain old hard data and said, we don't see any evidence of a climate crisis in it. That's in their abstract. Yep. And a paper had been published for a year and a half. And the usual suspects, Michael Mann and um, the other people from Real Climate, they went after it and got it retracted because they didn't like it. Let's let's get let's give a little more history here. So the paper they set out to say, okay, everyone keeps claiming there's a climate crisis. These these are a group of Italian researchers. So we went out to look at the data and see if that that's in evidence. And all they said, they didn't say there is no We seem to have lost Sterling. And Lene, you're muted and or we're dead. muted. Yeah. Mary, you're and, back now, Sterling. Oh, he's back. Uh, and so that 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 was just a paper. It's an academic paper, a small European journal. Um, but what happened was an Australian politician took notice of this. And he discussed it at a public forum, saying, look, this paper says there's no crisis. And then the Australian media took notice. And they started writing, good God, this paper says there's no climate crisis. How can they get away with that? And then... The Guardian and some news services got a hold of it and started publicizing it and saying, this journal allowed these great crackpots to publish a paper. And then Michael Mann and the others got involved. No one noticed it for a year. But once they started noticing it, all of a sudden pressure was applied to this small journal and they made it clear, basically, uh, we will never publish in your journal. We won't reference your journal. You should re-examine this. Uh, because this is wrong. Now, when they retract their, their notice of retraction, they didn't cite a single fact that was wrong. They didn't cite a single conclusion that was drawn from facts that were wrong. In other words, they found no error in the paper itself. But they said this, questions have been raised and we lost confidence in it. So we've withdrawn it. Because questions were raised as opposed to any other scientific area where questions might be raised. Well, that's what you have discussions for and debate. Someone should have written a paper to refute it or to point out what those questions were. They didn't do that. They retracted the paper. That is uh, intellectual cowardice on the part of the journal and its yep, publisher. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It, it, it's, it's abysmal. It's embarrassing. It's a black mark on science, but it's not new because nope. we know from 2009, a little thing called climate gate that people like uh, man and others have been trying to suppress contrary research, things that undermine their claims. Yeah. The famous uh, quote from Dr. Phil Jones of the climate research unit in England said, and I quote, and I'm, yeah. I'm reciting this to memory. Kenneth and I, referring to Kevin Trendor, or Kevin and I will keep these papers out of the journals somehow. I don't even see if, either of these papers appearing in, you know, it's just. It, no, but we went on. Even if we have to redefine what peer review is. 
There you go. Exactly. Uh, so it's like these two guys, we've decided peer review is not peer review because it, it allowed this to get through and we can't have that. So it's like, this is not new. It's a sad, another sad chapter in a long history of um, the undermining of science. It's not climate yeah. science. It's science. It's the scientific right. method. It's critical thinking. When they attack research in climate change because it makes some people uncomfortable and questions are raised, that hurts the entire scientific discipline. I agree. But there's a long history of this. It goes all the way back to Galileo, you know, Galileo and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was the consensus of the time. You know, the the earth is the center of the universe because God made it that way. And that's it. Shut the heck up, everybody else that has any other ideas. And so they persecuted Galileo for producing evidence, data that showed that earth was not the center of the universe. Not at all. I think Galileo is the one that did the world is round Copernicus is the yeah. is. anyway. But point is, is that the Catholic Church suppressed research they did not like uh, with Galileo, and that it's been going on ever since. And we've had the same thing happen in the medical community back in the 1990s. Um, well, you prob certainly you're old enough to remember probably the uh, the commercials we used to see on TV about antacids and yeah. stomach ulcers and all that stuff. Back then, in the 60s and 70s, the belief in the medical community was that stomach ulcers were caused by stress. That's it. Well, a couple of internists down in um, Australia started questioning this because this one guy had access to cadavers that were coming in on a regular basis, and he was using it to look at using those cadavers to look at something else. But he noticed something curious. He noticed that everyone had had a medical record showing ulcers also had these lesions on the inside of the stomach, and these lesions happened to contain bacteria. And these this was unheard of because it was believed at the time bacteria could not live in the stomach because of its highly acidic nature. Well, he kept looking at this. He published papers on it, and the papers were like, eh, nuts, forget him. You know, they just dismissed it. They dismissed it as not being possible, even though he had hard evidence that showed there were, in fact, um, bacteria living in the stomach. It was called the Heliobacter pylori. And so finally getting no traction in science, where science was just the consensus of science was just saying, "Mm -mm, nah, nah, nah. He decided he's going to prove it. So he drank a concoction of Heliobacter pylori. He drank the bacteria and gave himself ulcers to prove it. The guy got a Nobel Prize, I believe, in 2001 in medicine. And now science they, was forever changed. Look, it goes back, it, it goes back, of course, much farther than that in the medical community at one time. Uh, the consensus was that um, illness was due to an imbalance of humors in the body. That's why they bled people. Um, that that if you got the the black bile and the yellow bile and then all the all the humor's right. You were in good shape. And of course that was wrong. Um, shown through experimentation as, as opposed to theory. Um, it, it, it's, it's. Can, it, I think Thomas Kuhn described it pretty good in the, his book, the structure of scientific revolutions. Um, unlike a, a gentleman who recently opined, uh, a science educator who recently opined that cl- that science is about consensus, it's about coming to consensus. No, that's not what science is about. It's about looking at looking for knowledge, and uh, sometimes discoveries come about that revolutionize everything. They change the consensus. It doesn't matter what the consensus is. If it's wrong, it's wrong because there are uh, physical facts. But the people who believe in consensus, who believe that's what science really is, it's, it's just a matter of taking votes, coming to comity and agreement, they believe in the social construction of knowledge and truth. You know, we, uh, no, how do we determine what's right and wrong? Oh, well, we just sort of vote on it, and, and then that's what it is. And that's the truth. It's yeah. like, that's, that's not the way it is. Look, uh, you can, I, I, I wrote in something recently, you can... Uh, you can call a bear a kite, but it's not going to go up in the wind if you tie a string around it and try and drag it 
you know, in a, on a windy day. It's not going to take flight uh, because bears aren't kites. And that's, and I don't care how many people believe bears are kites. Uh, they aren't. Yeah. Linnea, you got any comments before we move on to the next topic? I do not have much to add to that. Okay. Well, Sterling did a good job on that. So let's leave it at that. So the next thing we want to talk about is the recent paper from Soon Al Al, Ed Al, uh, Dr. Ronan Connolly, Dr. Mike uh, Connolly, and um, also David Gates was published in this. And they published this paper basically talking about two things in the, in the paper, which could have been separate papers in my opinion, but they combined it into one. Basically, they talked about the sun's role in climate, um, and they also talked about the fact that it seems that um, urban heatings is mostly responsible for the temperature increases we've seen. But anyway, bottom line is they published this paper. Immediately, the climate cabal sprung into action and they brought out their super rebuttals. Yes, indeed. They Twitterized it to death and they made fun of it. They mocked it. And so, you know, it can't be the sun because... We're climate scientists. We know better. And so what happens is they uh, published here on Dr. Judith Curry's website a rebuttal to all of this dissing that's going on, uh, particularly Dr. Gavin Schmidt. Gavin who, Schmidt. Yeah. Dr. Gavin Schmidt. Um, Gavin anyway, Schmidt. He runs NASA Guess, who also runs the most cited temperature record in the world, which in my opinion is badly, badly flawed, but they don't want to admit that. In any event, so there was a, a lot of controversy surrounding this paper because it was another, you know, consensus buster type of thing. And so what happened is, is that uh, Schmidt started dissing it. Uh, they put up a post on realclimate.org talking about how bad it was and so forth and so on. Uh, they did some terribly mocking things on Twitter. Um, anyway, so now what they're doing and here's this email that they sent. We got this via Dr. Willie Soon earlier today. This email that we got basically says, we're going to come after you because two of the scientists involved were working for a government agency. They're going after an FOI type thing to see where you were using government time improperly, you know, to basically write this paper. Um, <laughs> Well, it's that what they're doing, they're going after the editor of the journal. He was a guest editor. He was part of the USGS. And so they're going after his emails. Did you communicate with these people? Did you have exchanges? We want to see your emails with climate skeptics. And the, and the problem, you know, look, the data is what the data is. Um, I, I want to go beyond and say, the paper was not just a few academics, right? It wasn't just Willie and David and a, and a couple of others. So it involved 38 different researchers uh, from 18 different, from research institutes and universities in 18 different countries representing four of the continents. This wasn't some, uh, you know, right-wing conspiracy hatched in some, a location in the United States. Um, and this is the conclusion they came to looking at the data. And Gavin and his friends who started their own website, it's not peer reviewed. Let's be clear. When people cite this website, it's their private website. It's, it's basically their blog. We think this and we want to be taken seriously. So we created our own website and we critique other people rather than they could write the journal and try and refute it. They could write their own paper showing uh, why all these scholars got it wrong. That's not what they do. As you say, Anthony, they're mocking it. And now they're trying to apply pressure. Uh, I take it the pressure won't work on the, uh, the actual guest editor because he's no longer the editor. He was a guest editor for one issue. Um, but it'll serve as a, it could serve as a warning to others. If you get papers like this, you'd better not publish because we'll come after you. We'll make your life miserable. Even if we don't discover anything wrong, it takes up time and resources to respond to these guys. And that's what they're counting on because they're, yeah. they're big government funded, right? They get millions of dollars in funding. Um, 
so they can they can use your taxpayer dollars to do stuff like this. Yeah, and so you know, um, basically, here's an email we got from uh, Willie Soon this morning. He says, uh, "My office received a strange FOI request from the director of NASA, guest Gavin Schmidt, who wants to p- investigate my activities as an editor for the MDPI journal Climate. He wants to publicize the actions of federal officials." working in their official capacity on his blog. The hypocrisy is stunning here because, you know, we've got people like Schmidt and Mann and so forth that are bullying other editors of climate journals to get things removed. And these guys are now after, you know, soon and so forth, uh, soon et al, for basically using their time to publish something. Not to get it retracted, it, it, it's lunacy. It's lunacy and, and it's tribalism, tribalism. And, yeah, and by the way, I mean, look, those guys went through a lot of this back during the uh, the Climate Gate scandal, right? Uh, but they fiercely defended and saying, "No, no, we don't need to respond to these FOIA requests. We 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 don't have to answer your questions." Uh, they 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 seriously tried to ignore their government's demands that we pay you. Uh, you must turn over the data and the the the, the emails. Uh, they said, no, 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 we don't have to do that. Uh, you know, some of them lost their emails. Uh, a case in Arizona uh, was settled just a couple of years ago, where the, the the court said you must turn it over. You're you're a government employee. You don't get to tell your university you don't have to respond. Uh, so uh, look. It's it's not science. It's not the way science was supposed to practice, but it is typical of the way climate science is practiced. And that's how you get this idea of consensus, right? So how do they? Where do we come up with this idea of the consensus? Well, some guy goes out and has his grad students count journal entries and make up whether it says something about climate change or not. And if it says climate change, well, it's human climate change. Well, how do you count the journal entries? Well, you it, it's, it only works, you know, you only get the 97% if you suppress entries like Willie's and theirs, if you don't let them get published or if you have them retracted once they're published. Suddenly you build a consensus because there's no other point of view allowed out there. Right, right. And, you know, it's, it's funny that, they, they just don't see themselves. They, they they don't look from the outside to see how this appears. And it's, the appearances for science are not at all good. Now, here's more of that email. He says, Gavin wants to investigate my email exchange with climate skeptics that he thinks I've communicated with as guest editor of Climate. I do not know most of the people on his list. Why would a NASA scientist be interested in email communications of a guest editor? To find dirt, maybe? As the philosopher Immanuel Kant once said, you can only see in others what you see in yourself. I wonder if Gavin hopes to find something shady in my communication with scientists because of the shady business he's been involved in while pushing the false AGW narrative. You know, it boils down to projection. They're always projecting what they're doing on you. Yeah. Gotcha. Right? Yep. Right. But interestingly enough, Gavin Schmidt did, in fact, listen to me for the very first time this week. Yes, he posted something on his Twitter page that was astounding. Because of the way he was acting, I called him in a Twitter thread because he was mocking Dr. Soon. I mean, just doing stupid stuff that scientists shouldn't do. I called him a despicable cad. He liked it. And he put it on his masthead for his Twitter. Yes, win! (laughs) You know, well... (laughs) That uh, he he takes that as a as a uh, a moniker of honor, right? You know, right? Uh, they 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 finally, as if we hadn't noticed him or thought that about him, and probably some of us said it about him long before. Is he Gavin Schmidt or Gavin Smuck? Because I think he's a smuck. Well, yeah. whatever whatever his personal qualities are, I do think it's funny when people put mean quotes about themselves on their Twitter bio. I don't care who it is. I think it's funny every time. I'll do it. Someday I'll get a good enough review from a, a climate alarmist and I'll get to put it on my Twitter bio. <laughs> and it'll be I, funny. I, I, Someone wrote yeah. me once uh, and I don't put these things on my bio because I don't <laughs> care enough about social media to care about that stuff. 
But I know they, they've still got the emails because it's it's actually still floating out there on the web, sadly enough. But he called me a fat, smelly bastard. Oh, really? And I wrote him back and I said, I take umbrage at your comments. I bathe every Did day. Did you have to explain umbrage to him? What that meant? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He never wrote me back. But I said, I, I said, I bathe every day. Uh, I know who my parents are and they were married. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll cop to the overweight. I'll cop to being overweight. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we've got some questions apparently here and there. Uh, so let's see what we've got for questions in our, uh, from our viewers and uh, see if we can answer some of them. First question from Fillerator. How can one even calculate a mean? Didn't Ross McKittrick point out that the further you go back in time, the greater or the more the variability? Well, yeah, the uncertainty does get greater as you go back further in time. Is uh, so? Do you think that calculating global average temperature is useful for very much at all? Or is it just because that's something that I've been curious about. And I know a lot of our commenters ask things. It's nonsense. Um, it's nonsense. Uh, when, it's you so use noisy. Averages, when you use averages in classrooms, for instance, you are trying to gauge something. Uh, how well a teacher is doing, how much progress students are making. And they've set up this numerical system. And how you determine that is you take all their scores you add them up and then you divide them by the number of students. And that gives you the average for the classroom. But that, it only tells you about that one classroom. And it, it doesn't tell you about any individual student. And it could be skewed by some super geniuses and some super idiots. Uh, it's just an average. Now, what's the average of the global temperature? So you take all the different thermometer readings ground-based sea, but you know, I, I don't, you, you, whether you do satellite, every, all of it, you throw it into a bundle, you divide it by the number of, of stations reporting, and that gives you a number. But what does that number tell you right. about the earth itself? There is no, we don't know what the temperature of the earth should be, or is, we don't know what it's, best for humankind or civilization or the environment. One day we will all go away and the earth will abide. And is that a better or worse world? Well, it's better for, it's worse for us, but they've got this God's eye point of view. Somehow they've determined that the prime, the best temperature for human beings was sometime before now, presumably not in the middle of the ice age. Uh, but sometime between when the Ice Age ended and now. Um, but that's made up. That's their decision for what the Earth should be. There's no objective number. Yeah. You know, I want to point out that when we inherited the Earth, it didn't come with a user manual. And so there was no specific listing in there. This is the correct temperature for running the planet. So everything that we have about, you know, it's getting too warm, you know, because of climate change or whatever, everything that we have is a matter of opinion. That's it. I mean, we can, I can tell you for a location what temperature it takes to boil water, right? In some places, the temperature is a little bit lower because of uh, altitude. Uh, that's pretty objective. Uh, Lost them again. Yeah, apparently either he's been censored or he had an internet problem. Not sure which. Yeah, well, I think I'm back. Uh, oh, there yeah, you I are. Think you're back. Yeah, I can tell you how, what the temperature is to boil water for different locations based on altitude, but it's pretty objective. Um, so while <laughs> Sterling's been lost again in the bit. internet, but we have another question up here, and I think that Linnea can address. From Climate Talk, the Heartland Institute, Gavin, update soon. Okay, I'm having a little trouble understanding this. I'll read it out. The Heartland Institute, Gavin, update soon solar curve with recent OBS. Why does this correlation completely fall apart? Doesn't that undermine soon at all? I, I don't know. Okay, that, it says it says that Gavin's updated um, that soon solar curve with recent observation. Um, 
does his why does his correlation completely fall apart? Does okay, you're talking about what, post, what was posted yeah. up on Gavin's Twitter feed, right? Um, this is not an area that I'm very good in. Uh, I have not seen uh, Gavin's update or whatever contribution he's making to the soon at all or his uh, specific questions about their work. Um, but I think that most of our problem here, if there is, because I think, Anthony, you've pointed out before that you have significant questions and debate about the the kind of research that's done on the solar side of the climate debate. Right. So you you yourself have questions about this. We're not saying that, no. you know, there are no questions to be had. The research is flawless, anything like that. What our issue is that we are pointing out today is the the actions taken to get FOIA requests in order to try to, it appears to dig up dirt on um, scientists that take a different perspective. Um, the idea that you might limit yourself or that it's making other scientists limit what they include in their papers in order to get published because they are afraid or they are wary of this kind of um, antagonistic perspective that some of the um, very powerful people in the climate community have taken. It's, it's, it's something that we, and we can't, you know, I don't have like, uh, and it, I don't have data points for you to show that there is a serious problem with people being afraid to publish their research or afraid to publish their research if it shows the wrong conclusions. But, you know, we get emails all the time from scientists, you know, saying, thanks for talking about this kind of stuff. I have to censor myself, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure Anthony hears it way more than any of us. And it's been going on for a long time. I want to say that um, I wonder if Gavin is responding to something that Willie wrote years ago. Um, as opposed to his three new papers that just got published. Uh, the papers don't focus for the most part on solar irradiance, uh, but they do do different, different time series and different things. One of, one of the time series includes solar irradiance and volcanoes. I don't know if that's what Gavin is responding to, but if it's so great, publish it. Don't put it on your blog and say, I've refuted you. Yeah, Publish the data it. in a peer-reviewed data in a peer-reviewed journal. Let let other people look at it as opposed to saying I've done this and I've proven it, and I, I put it on my blog because that's the evidence. And there's a lot of that from both sides too. You know, there's plenty of people who are shooting from the hip on on the more skeptical side who sometimes say things or will assert things that we on this podcast wish they wouldn't. I'm sure, you know, Anthony in particular, he knows quite a few yeah. people on our side that sometimes shoot from the hip and, and can make some rash judgments or some rash um, uh, kind of declarations about the um, solidity of a particular point that they have. Um, and I, and I think that there's nothing wrong with pointing out problems from across the board. Uh, okay. So this is the data. Is this yeah. the one that this guy yeah, is talking this is about? The one he's referring to where basically the prediction didn't match the actual data. But I want to point out something really salient here. This is exactly what happened with man's Michael or Michael Mann's hockey stick, although <laughs> differently. Here we have data versus predictions that are diverging. And so what Mann did is he didn't like that part that started going down post-1960 with the tree ring data. So what does he do? He covered it up with new data coming in from observations to make it disappear. Well, soon hasn't done that. But I would ask Gavin, why didn't you point out the same thing about Michael Mann's garbage hockey stick paper? Yeah, one of the things he did, also Mann did, was he just left out tree rings that didn't that didn't fit the narrative that he wanted exactly to he would have yeah. got what man did has got rid of that you know it's not it's not man's data but if this were a man's data man basically got rid of that blue section you know I, what i think it would be fair and i think that we would we have a plan to have a solar episode coming up soon i believe and so speaking of soon uh we, we will be able to have someone if not him someone in his field 
to discuss these issues. And I think that would be a good chance for us to address some of, you know, maybe bring up some of what Gavin is bringing well, up here and see yeah. if maybe it's a legitimate get, complaint. Yeah. So we should have soon, soon, and yeah. we should get a Dr. Gavin Schmidt on here. We should invite him and he can uh, tell yeah. us. Cause, cause we know those guys really love to debate. Right. They, they, they're yeah. all about the discussion and debate and exchange. Right. This is, uh, you know, this I have, same. yeah, this... we, we, we should get soon. We should get legates. Uh, they might address this, but also look, the person that sent that question, um, I suggest that they go to, uh, to uh, Judas site because Willie and them did respond to uh, this and you can see their response there. And then you can decide whether it, it satisfies your curiosity or you think they've, uh, they've got it right or, or not. Right. So we'll see if we can't get Dr. Schmidt along with Dr. Soon in a future. But I will point out, Dr. Schmidt, when he was asked to appear on television with Dr. Roy Spencer, would not even sit in the same studio with him. Yeah. You know, Schmidt did his spiel, and then he left the studio because Dr. Roy Spencer was coming in. We can't be on the same stage with Dr. Roy Spencer because, gosh, my argument is so strong, it couldn't withstand what Dr. Spencer had to say. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Anyway, oh, so let's get to the last of the questions and see what we've got there. We've got questions coming up. Samot says, has anyone ever applied a four-year transformation to climate? Yes, 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 and a thousand times yes. We've done a zillion Fourier transforms, and yes, they show all kinds of different things, not necessarily anything useful. All right, next question. Michael Simpson, does scientific truth depend on the number of papers saying there is a crisis? versus the number of saying there is no crisis. Well, I would say it's about 101 in terms of that ratio. We've got lots of people out there screaming climate crisis, which I will point out is a marketing tool, not science. And but, one but, comes along and they have to suppress it. But let's answer his question. No, it has nothing whatsoever to do. It's, it's not eight. It's not scientific truth. It's truth. Science discovers facts, data, knowledge expands knowledge and that is what the truth is and right taking a votes consensus has nothing to do with the truth of something yep and so that on that note we're going to end the show there comes the music and we are ready to go I want to make a quick, I want to make a quick comparison that I just thought of though. Just, okay. you know, you can't use that kind of a, there's more papers saying this than that because there's probably more books talking about Bigfoot being real than there are about Bigfoot not being real. <laughs> Just because the perspective is more interesting and more fun to talk about and it probably sells better. So I wouldn't say that a number of papers is a good metric to determine truth. Yes. Yeah, you should do it by weight, not by number. <laughs> Giant it, loads of paper. If you do it by the number of words written a week, I'm going to win. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay, good point. All right, thanks everybody for joining us here. Thank you, our viewers. And I want to remind you all to visit climaterealism.com on a regular basis, where we debunk the media scare stories every day. Also visit climateataglance.com, where we have references for some of the most uh, egregious uh, points of climate catastrophism. And energyataglance.com, which is Linnea's website, talking about all the different aspects of energy, where it works and where it doesn't. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and uh, goodbye. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate for the Heartland Institute, wishing you a great Friday and a great weekend. Bye-bye. How dare you!